That's ridiculous. <laughs> the next item of business is debate on motion 17347 in the name of Christina McKelvey on it's time to end the stigma of the menopause. Would those who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Christina McKelvey to speak to and move the motion for 12 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I'd quite like to have started the debate with a splash today, which obviously I have done. I am uh, uh, very pleased and proud to be open this debate on behalf of the government debate, which I believe is the first ever government debate held in the UK on menopause. So this parliament should be proud of itself today. And it's coming at a time when this issue is finally getting the rightful attention it deserves, that women deserve. I think we can all agree that the menopause has always been stigmatised, ignored or treated as a joke at best and used as a way to grade, degrade women at the worst. Just as women are not a homogenous group, the impact of the menopause on women varies significantly. Some women will experience menopause at a significantly younger age, either naturally or because of surgical or medical intervention, for example, as a result of cancer treatment. And for many, research says 10%, the negative impact of women on women is life changing. Women and girls in many cases are unprepared for the changes caused by menopause, so they suffer in silence, invisible. They feel too ashamed, inadequate or embarrassed to seek help, and many women are actually unaware that help is possible. So we have to change this to support them through the menopause and end the stigma that surrounds it. Make it and the women dealing with it visible. This debate today I hope will help towards that. MSPs from all parties talking about the menopause openly and recognising the impact it can have. I would want to thank everyone here today and say I'm, pr I'm proud that women and men in this parliament are here to today to discuss such an issue in public on the record that all too clearly needs discussed. As we mark the 20th anniversary of this parliament, maybe a debate like this on the menopause shows just how much we have grown up. To help illustrate the impact of menopause to the chamber, I thought it would be useful to highlight some of the 34 known symptoms. The most common are night sweats, hot flushes, irregular or very heavy periods, fatigue, inability to concentrate, loss of libido, mood swings, hair loss, insomnia, weight gain, joint pain, depression, and presiding officer, clumsiness. <laughs> They're just a fraction of the health issues that women face, we know that. And most women will be dealing with multiple symptoms while juggling work and a busy family life or maybe with caring responsibilities. It's not solely raising the issue as a minister for equality for me, it's, it's, it's much wider than that. And I know how it feels personally and I'm sure many women across the chamber do too. Yes, yeah, certainly. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. But she also recognise that the symptoms that she mentioned there are also the symptoms of uh, underactive thyroid. And quite often when women have that, they're not tested because they're told at a certain age that it's the menopause and therefore they're not even tested. Christina McKelvey. Yeah, absolutely, I, I, I would recognise that. And I'm sure that um, a, Elaine Smith would, would realise that the comments are made about many other things being uh, a suite of health issues that women face, that, that would be one of them. So during my time in office, presiding officer, I'm determined to make a real difference to women who need help and support with the menopause. A big part of this is to get people talking about it, getting women talking to other women to share information on what works and what doesn't, to highlight the very issues that Elaine Smith just uh, intervened on, to listen to the issues that each other face, offer support and reassurance. And for some women who told me that thought that you think you're losing your mind and that not, you know, we're not all uh, uh, alone in this and some women all feel the same way so it's about sharing some of that lived experience but women telling each other their war stories from a war that only they know about won't change their experience or the experiences of younger women who will face the same battles in the future that's why it's so important that wider society pays attention to listen to women's experiences and learn from them be it their partners family members employers or health practitioners and that's why I'm so pleased to see the work being done and undertaken now by the elected members, our trade union bodies, women's organisations and even in the media. I know many of members will have seen the coverage on the BBC Breakfast Menopause themed week last week. And that shows just the breadth and the depth of issues facing women young and older. Also, the groundbreaking documentary by Kirsty Wark and the insightful articles by Mandy Rhodes, editor of The Hollywood Magazine, who have both opened up about their own experiences, which women have found absolutely relatable. 
they have helped make this issue in those women visible. And that's why today's debates and events, including recent, the recent menopause festival I spoke at last month, yes, we had a festival, and the menopause cafes, both founded by the very wonderful Rachel, Rachel Weiss up in Perth, that's why these are so important. They are raising awareness and shining a light on a hidden taboo subject. So we are continuing to build on that momentum gathered from all of this activity, which also includes the Scottish Women's Convention Conference held in February and the upcoming Festival of Ageing that the Scottish Government has funded, which takes place this Thursday, the 23rd of May at Glasgow Caledonia University. This will continue that public conversation. The festival is aimed at delegates as well as the public, so I'm delighted that it will extend the reach of the conversation even further to a much wider audience. All of this awareness raising work will ensure that the deafening silence around the menopause is no more. Women are reclaiming the airwaves and they have grabbed the foghorns and we are all prepared to shout about it, to make themselves heard as well as seen. That's why it's so important to take action, simply because the women have the right to be well. The menopause affects women physically and mentally and sometimes to devastating effect. We know that most women go through the menopause between the ages of 48 and 55. The symptoms can last for over 10 years and we know that the average age of menopause is 51. But as I've already said, it can happen to some women much, much younger. There is also an economic imperative for addressing the impact of the menopause. We all know our population is ageing. On the 3rd of April, I published a Fair of Scotland for Older People and one of the areas it considers is the change in Scotland's population demographics. There has been a 5.5% increase in employment rates of women aged 50 to 64 in Scotland since 2008, which means that we have more women in the workforce. And with over 60% of women between 50 and 64 in employment, more are now working through and beyond the menopause. Add that to the potential impact of Brexit on key areas of our workforce, and you can see that it's absolutely essential that we keep our workers, whose skills and experience are so important, in employment for as long as they want to be. That means changing workplace, workplaces to ensure it allows us to, to work flexibly and that employers really understand the needs of their employees. This makes good business sense, but it also is the right thing to do. Despite employment law being currently reserved to the UK government, which limits the actions we can take, we are finding opportunities to promote the agenda of fair work and workplace equality. That includes the rights of women experiencing the menopause. And I can highlight some progress here. I'd like to commend the work of the STUC Women's Committee, who carried out a survey on the menopause in the workplace in October 2017. The survey investigated the experiences of women, how Scottish employers are responding to this issue, and what resources the STUC Women's Committee could develop for women in the workplace. Over 3,000 women participated, and it found that 99% of respondents either didn't have or didn't know if they had a workplace menopause policy. 63% said the menopause had been treated as a joke at work. And 32% <coughs> said the menopause was treated negatively in the workforce. The Women's Committee are now collating menopause policies and information from affiliate unions and members' workplaces in order to develop a best practice model for distribution. Very welcome indeed. And also, due mainly to the work of Deputy Provost Councillor Colette Stevenson, South Lanarkshire Council have now implemented a menopause policy supported across all the groups in South Lanarkshire. And this is now being used by many other employers, including local authorities, as a model for developing of their own guidance. And I have made sure that the government is updating its current men menopause policy into guidance and support for women and their managers as we should be leading by example in government. And we had five menopause cafes across government just a few weeks ago, all of them oversubscribed. So that means that there is a need and a want there. We are also encouraging all employers, including other public bodies, to update and or provide menopause awareness training and guidance for their managers. Our recently published Affair of Scotland for Women Gender Pay Gap Action Plan includes actions to support women affected by the menopause. The action plan sets our commitment to fund a feasibility study for a centre for flexible work in Scotland. This centre, a UK first, would design, test, embed and scale new approaches to increase the availability of quality flexible work in Scotland. We are also funding several projects through the £750,000 Workplace Equality Fund to support the development of age-inclusive workplace practices. 
In partnership with Impact Funding Partners, we supported a Workplace Equality Fund business-to-business -business learning event in March to share good practice, including lessons learnt on the adoption of more age-inclusive working practices. And we're expanding the fund further so that, importantly, it will now seek to encourage projects that provide support to female workers during the menopause. A great list, but I'm not finished yet, presiding officer. We also have refreshed the great gender and diversity element of the Scottish Business Pledge to give employers access to information and advice on issue, issues such as the menopause. As we know, older women impact, are impacted by the gender pay gap. It is clear that the menopause can be one of the contributing factors to women's lack of progression and career choices based on their need to manage their health, both mental and physical. So we are committed also to working closely with women's organisations and trade unions to gain a clearer picture of the issues involved in order to identify other areas where action needs to be taken. And I'm sure many members will tell us some of those ideas today and I'm looking forward to hearing them. In conclusion, presiding officer, I'd like to read the words of Agnes Tolmey, chair of the Scottish Women's Convention, as she introduced the convention's menopause survey results earlier this year. Nearly 1,000 women took part in that survey and they cannot be ignored. She said, and I quote, menopause covers much more than just a physical transition. We hear about workplace discrimination on a daily basis, but we very rarely hear about this in relation to such a crucial issue as the menopause. This is for a number of reasons. Stigma, fear of demotion, and fear of being singled out as too old. These women are carers, they are workers, many are of the very backbone of our communities and our societies, and yet, they are made to feel ostracised by a perfectly normal event that every woman goes through. What we need is information and understanding from the outset, from pre-menopause to what comes after. We need to listen to women with direct lived experiences. Policymakers and politicians must understand the impacts the menopause has in order to affect change. Presiding officer, I totally agree with Agnes Tommy. That's why it, I am very proud to move the motion today in my name. Now call Annie Welsh for around eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I would like to thank the, the Minister for bringing this topic to the Chamber today. Although around 50% of the population will experience menopause at some point in their life, it unfortunately remains an incredibly taboo subject. For far too long, women have felt not able to talk about the menopause openly, with the wider impact being a society that has little understanding of its symptoms. I'm really pleased that we're having this debate today to raise awareness of the menopause and help end the stigma that surrounds it. But what exactly is the menopause? The menopause is when a woman stops having periods and is no longer able to get pregnant naturally. It's a natural part of aging that usually occurs between the ages of 48 and 55, as we've heard. Most women will experience menopausal symptoms, some of which can be quite severe and impact um, impact significantly on their everyday activities. These can begin months or even years before your period stops and can last up to four years after. Symptoms include hot flushes, night sweats, low mood and anxiety, reduced libido and problems with memory or concentration. The impact on women's life is significant. A British Menopause Society survey found over half, women, over half the women who had gone through the menopause said it had a negative impact on their life and over a quarter of women said they felt less outgoing in social situations and felt more isolated. And a third said they no, they no longer felt like good company. To hear these statistics makes me feel quite sad and having spoken to many women who have experienced the menopause, they feel as though no one's listening to them. And if I'm completely honest, over the past few months, I've felt the start of the symptoms of the menopause and I've I have been a little anxious about what's to come. But this debate has come at a right time for me as I've been able to learn more about it, which I'm sure will make the process easier. What's clear from these statistics is that there are significant implications for women's mental health as well as physical health, and these need to be addressed. For me, much of the taboo stems from this being a part of our lives we don't necessarily want to think about, let alone talk about. The danger of that, though, is we don't normalise talking about it and we're not mentally or physically prepared for when it does come or not able to support or understand the experiences of someone in our life who's going through it. Normalising talking about it is absolutely key to this debate. 
and it is important that this is done from an early age, particularly when one in 100 women will experience the menopause before 40. Men too are incredibly important to this debate and has already been raised. The BMS found that 38% of men said they felt helpless when it comes to supporting their partners through the menopause and a third say they often end up having arguments because they don't understand what their partners are going through. These again are significant statistics highlighting that this, is just a women's issue, highlight this isn't just a women's issue, it affects everyone in society. So how do we start the discussion? Education, talking to one another, or simply just saying the word menopause in our everyday conversations? And I was really pleased too to see the BBC coverage in, uh, last week as part of its Wake Up to Menopause campaign. And so many people have come to me, friends and family, to talk about it. And there seems to have been a very wide reach. There were segments on a variety of issues. The story of a young woman who began early menopause at just 15. And a short film by a BBC presenter opening up about her own menopause story. And my favourite, a clip following a group of women in Wales who found that wild water swimming alleviated their anxiety and menopause symptoms. What we, but what we need to do now is keep the momentum going. There are great initiatives out there already, as we've heard. World Menopause Day is held in October every year, presenting an opportunity for us to mark the progress that's been made each year and continue to raise awareness. And as we've heard, the creation of menopause cafes across the UK has allowed women to discuss the menopause with no set agenda. These cafes give women the opportunity to talk about their symptoms and share information on what's worked for them. And at the University of Leicester, a menopause specific, specific policy has been introduced, as well as male and female university staff being encouraged to say the word menopause three times a day to help normalise it. Women are encouraged to confidently announce in a meeting when they're having a hot flush. And I'm having one now, so that's okay. <laughs> On the last point, it's in the workplace that vastly need to improve support for women experiencing the menopause. In the same BMS survey, 47% of women in employment who needed to take the day off because of the menopause said they would feel uncomfortable with disclosing the real reason. And 45% of women experiencing strong symptoms felt that this had a negative impact on their work. And only yesterday I met a, a couple of ladies in Glasgow and we, did, we sat, had a coffee, a cake and chatted about the menopause. Because they contacted me during Mental Health Awareness Week last week um, because they felt it was having a detrimental effect or an, an impact on their mental health. And despite one of the ladies being signed off by her GP for severe menopausal symptoms, she was facing disciplinary action, although having been in the company for over 25 years. This was going on at the same time as her struggling to cope at home, leaving her feelings isolated and not knowing where to turn. So hearing about this firsthand really highlighted to me just how stressful the menopause can be for some women. And as with any health problem, physical or mental, we need to embed an understanding of menopause into the workplace culture so that women are not suffering alone. Again, this is where a better understanding of the symptoms of menopause would be very helpful. Many women struggle with concentration and if, if employers don't understand this, it's easy to see how the situation arises. The Equality Act does establish the importance of reasonable workplace adjustments and these could include anything from considerations of temperature, temperature control to the use of flexible home working. And I, I welcome the work of the Scottish Women's Convention and this week I want to ask a number of employers, both in the public and private sector, what measures they have in place to educate managers on the menopause and support women experiencing it. And I will happily um, share those responses once I, once I receive them. And I am keen that this is an area we continue to build on for years to come. Yeah, absolutely. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the member for taking our intervention. I wonder if it would be also important to just mention on the record that some more information about how physio can help with stress incontinence for women. That would also be something that, that might add to the debate, I think. Annie Wells. Yeah, absolutely agree with Elaine Smith on that point. And we do have to remember that there's lots of different ways that we can get the help and support. And it's not just one size doesn't fit all. So we do need to be very proactive and, and have these discussions. Um, Presiding officer, I am grateful to have had the opportunity to speak in today's debate. 
and I am pleased that it has been so consensual. For many women, this natural process is a time of anxiety and distress, and for that reason alone, it deserves our utmost attention. The first step towards destigmatizing the menopause is to talk about it in a way that normalizes it, allowing for everyone in society to become more knowledgeable about what women experience during this time. By the time we reach World Menopause Day in October, I really hope that we can talk about some of the changes we've already seen. Thank you. Call Monica Lennon for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Around 400,000 women in Scotland are experiencing the menopause transition right now. It's a normal part of life, but as the motion states, the menopause has been a taboo subject for too long. As the convener of the cross-party group on women's health, I'm proud that the menopause was one of the very first issues on our agenda. And I know it will mean a lot to women across Scotland that the Minister is putting the menopause front and centre. This debate is very welcome. Our actions must match our ambitions and I hope we will see real progress in the provision of menopause care across the NHS and an end to stigma and discrimination. It's about time we all became more clued up about the menopause. Yes, it's effectively when women stop getting periods, but I know from my campaigning interest around access to period products, people still get embarrassed talking about these natural processes. Symptoms, and there are many, 34, I believe, uh, linked to the menopause can last for several years. And it's important to recognise that everyone's experience will be different. Some lucky people have few symptoms at all. Menopause isn't an illness, but its effects can be damaging to health, especially if support is lacking. Postmenopausal women can lose up to 20% of their bone density caused by a lack of oestrogen and are by far the most common group to be diagnosed with osteoporosis. Women can limit the effects by staying active, making healthy nutritional choices, getting out in the sunshine to get more vitamin D, cutting down on caffeine and alcohol. So it's all, it's all very easy. Although most commonly experienced by women in their 50s, some women do experience early menopause. Campaigner Katie Johnston shared her story with the cross-party group on women's health after she went, underwent voluntary menopause in her early 20s to manage the crippling symptoms of endometriosis. And it was great, I think we all tuned into the BBC um, last week, although not every morning, but to see um, the menopause being talked about when people are eating their breakfast, I think more of that on the telly, please. And I was quite struck by Susan, who was featured. Susan has Down syndrome, and she talked about feeling up and down, depressed, teary, forgetful, and described feeling a bit scared that she didn't really know what was happening, what was going on. She was experiencing uh, perimenopause. Women with Down syndrome tend to reach the menopause earlier than the general population, sometimes 10 years earlier. And because of this, the symptoms can sometimes be missed or overlooked. So meeting the needs of women with disabilities is an important area of work. More generally, a survey conducted by the Scottish Women's Convention highlighted that almost two thirds of women felt there was not enough information available at the beginning of their menopause and that symptoms like fatigue and anxiety, which had been indicating perimenopause, were not linked. As Scottish Labour Health spokesperson, I've been campaigning for improved menopause care for women across Scotland, including improved access to menopause clinics. At the last count, only five health boards in Scotland offer a dedicated um, menopause clinic. And no matter where women live in Scotland, they should have access to high quality menopause care. And perhaps the minister can give an update on, on that aspect um, later in the debate. We should all be grateful to the many organisations who are doing fantastic work to champion the menopause agenda. And the Scottish Women's Convention um, holding their menopause conference in February this year helps to increase visibility. And I've been following the work of the STUC Women's Committee closely. Their groundbreaking report published last year looked at the experience of women in the workplace during the menopause. And to echo the words of Sharon Edwards, who came along to our CPG, um, Sharon and the STUC Women's Committee are right when they say there should not be an issue that's surrounded in, in secrecy. We should not be resigning our conversations to a whisper. Because the menopause in the workplace survey highlighted some really disheartening figures. 63% of women said the menopause had been treated as a, as a joke in their workplace. I mean, it is unacceptable, but I wonder if any of us are actually surprised. And the Minister is right to 
reference journalist Mansi Rhodes. Mansi has been refreshingly open in speaking about her experience of the menopause. And she said that other women have opened up to her, saying that they felt ignored, rejected, humiliated, and that's just by the medical establishment. And many women have said that in the workplace they feel disregarded, overlooked and isolated, all because of the way other people react to, to the menopause. So we know we have a lot of work to do. We've all heard the comments, oh, she must be on her period every time a woman is having a bit of a bad day and it switches to, oh, she must be going through the change when it comes to jokes about hot flushes and assumptions about the menopause. So I think we agree that these so-called jokes are not actually that amusing. And it's almost the anniversary of the, the Bank of England's deputy governor apologising for um, describing Britain's sluggish and, and slow and underperforming economy as menopausal. What does that say about bankers, I wonder? Because women experiencing the menopause shouldn't be put down or, or written off, and neither should their contribution to our economy and society. Yes, menopause can be challenging, it can be tiring, but it can also be liberating, signalling a new chapter and a sense of freedom. With more and more women working into their 50s and 60s, workplace policies and practices need to catch up. Employers are not being asked to make onerous changes, but a good menopause policy should be a minimum. My Members Bill for Universal Provision of Period Products would also help those experiencing the menopause to manage unpredictable and heavy bleeding. And this Scottish Parliament's Women's Network was instrumental in helping this Parliament to become the first in the world to make free period products available to staff and visitors. And that started from a conversation about the menopause at work in this building. So I pay tribute to Pam Curry and her committee and for also bringing Dr Hilary Jones, also off the telly, to Parliament to educate men and women and managers in the Parliament about the menopause. And like the Minister, I also commend Rachel Vice, who launched her first menopause cafe in June 2017, offering women in her hometown of Perth the chance to share their experiences and access peer-to-peer -peer support. That movement is inspiring. In conclusion, presiding officer, I am optimistic that Scotland is making progress. Only last week, North Ayrshire Council announced the development of a menopause policy, following in the footsteps of South Lancashire Council, who, working with the trade unions, already have a pioneering policy. And Councillor Colette Stevenson should be congratulated for, for driving this. So I'm delighted to support the motion and fully agree that raising awareness of the menopause is a good thing and we should all commit to doing so. Thank you very much. I call on Alison Johnson over the Greens. Ms Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. There has been increasing awareness of health issues affecting women, such as endometriosis and menopause in recent months, and some of this good work is taking place here in Parliament, um, including through the Cross-Party Group on Women's Health. Um, this debate is extremely timely and it's a welcome contribution to making sure that the menopause isn't an, in an invisible part of a woman's life. We know that menopausal symptoms can range from insomnia and distress to anxiety and even palpitations. These can be extremely debilitating, but the old assumptions are hard to shake off. It's still seen as something women just have to go through, like painful periods, no matter the cost to their health or well-being. As the motion rightly says, the menopause has for too long been seen as a women's issue. The STUC's 2018 report revealed that almost two-thirds of women in the workplace are within the age bracket when women, on average, go through the menopause. And yet, as has been mentioned, 99% of respondents reported that they either didn't have or didn't know of a workplace menopause policy. This is everyone's problem. Respondents reported having to take sick days because of symptoms, which could result in disciplinary action being taken. And given that around half of the workforce is female and that the vast majority of women will go through the menopause while off a working age, it really is incredible. I mean, frankly, it's appalling that this gap in provision still exists. And nor should we assume that, the that, that those experiencing the menopause are all of a certain age. Around one in a hundred women experience the menopause before they're 40. Some women enter early menopause because of medical treatment for conditions like endometriosis as a result of hysterectomy or, or simply genetics. Transgender and non-binary people may be affected by menopausal symptoms, so it's important that workplace support is in place for all who need it. 
I'd like to thank all those who contacted me with their experiences before the debate. They welcome this debate. I was contacted by one constituent who had a full hysterectomy at the age of 26 as treatment for endometriosis. She told me about the difference HRT has made to the quality of her life, but that it's becoming increasingly difficult to get access to a prescription due to fears about side effects. HRT is not appropriate for everyone, and there are certain risks and side effects associated with its use. However, it can be life-changing for some women. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists advises that the effects of HRT have been studied worldwide, and research shows that for most women, HRT works and is safe. The college also says that healthcare professionals should discuss individual risks based on research evidence at consultations. It's important that potential risks and benefits are explained fully to women so they can make an informed choice about treatment options. Endometriosis UK have done some great work on this issue and have developed a menstrual wellbeing toolkit in conjunction with the Royal College of GPs, which contains helpful tips for managing menopause in primary care. As the Minister noted, 63% of respondents to the STUC survey said that the menopause had been treated as a joke at work. There really needs to be a culture change here so that women feel confident and supported to talk about their experiences without fear of ridicule or dismissal. Um, I too applaud initiatives such as the Menopause Cafe. Um, and I believe that it's also led to Flush Fest, a festival dedicated entirely to the menopause. It is important that this message permeates workplace culture. The STUC and the NASUWT have already produced guidelines for employers. NASUWT, for example, recommends that employers provide awareness training for managers, paid time off for treatments such as HRT, and flexible working patterns. We need these provisions. They'll improve working conditions for those experiencing the menopause, but they'll also allow us to retain experienced staff. Presiding officer, this is about equity. We can't hope to tackle the gender pay gap until women are no longer penalised for having periods, getting pregnant or going through the menopause. The more open we are about these issues, the sooner we can dismantle old stereotypes and break down the barriers that working women, indeed all women, still face in 2019. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Liam MacArthur to open the Liberal Democrats. Mr MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, and this is, as the Minister reminded us, the first opportunity um, the Parliament's had to debate the men menopause. Uh, and so I'd like to start by thanking, congratulating the Minister on bringing uh, this debate to the Chamber, giving it a visibility, as she rightly uh, said. As the, as the motion rightly states, as women themselves are rightly and clearly stating, this is not just a woman's issue, the problems relating to stigma, the implications in terms of inequality, whether in the workplace or in terms of access to health services, these are things that need to be addressed by all, no matter uh, age, gender, faith, etc. Um, if we are to bring about full gender equality, whether that is in the struggle around equal pay, gender stereotypes or menopausal stigma, we need to start by talking about it, by raising uh, awareness. As men, I freely admit, we have absolutely no comprehension of what women experience during menopause, although I'd like to assure the Minister uh, that I really have come to terms with my own uh, clumsiness over the years. Uh, and that experience, of course, can vary enormously from one woman to the next with a wide range of symptoms and reactions, causes and implications. Uh, at the very least, however, we have a responsibility to listen, to support and to respond. Anything less represents a failure on our part. Seeing menopause as a normal part of life is also key, I think, uh, to removing some of that stigma, to lifting the taboo. It's the strong underlying message of Louise Minchin's video, uh, Menopause Journey, and a lot of the, um, the, uh, the, the programmes we've seen through the course of last week. But I also think there are strong and compelling arguments for saying that at the root of menopausal stigma lies the issue of health inequality. These, uh, of course, manifest them, themselves every day in all sorts of ways, but nowhere is it more obvious, perhaps, than when women go to their GPs with symptoms of menopause and don't get the support that they need. That is not always the case, of course, but too often it can be. To make matters work, worse in certain circumstances, doctors dismiss symptoms as menopause when they are actually signs of something more serious. Clearly, 
uh, the, this can have grave uh, consequences indeed. We hear of cases where women uh, have been misdiagnosed as having de depression and been placed uh, on antidepressants. Others who have presented with palpitations have then been referred to cardiologists. Some patients with urinary symptoms uh, have been referred to urologists and others uh, have been simply told that it is, as others have said, just the menopause so there is nothing that can be done. Whilst the 2015 NICE menopause guidelines are a step in the right direction, healthcare professionals need greater resources to enable them to accurately identify the menopause and better support women. It's also fair to say that the menopause can disproportionately affect those women who are already vulnerable within our uh, society, leading to detrimental effects both on their mental and indeed their physical health. In a recent report produced by Engender, uh, focusing purely on women with disabilities, the overwhelming majority felt they received poor or no information about menopause, its health implications, symptoms, or how indeed uh, to manage uh, those symptoms. More worryingly, they felt that doctors weren't uh, available to give information in an accessible way or to spend time with them to discuss any reproductive health concerns that impacted upon them. From the focus groups that took place, the main recommendations appeared to emerge, highlighting how essential it is to ensuring uh, that a learning disability or specialist nurse was available to speak to women about the menopause. A lack of resources was also highlighted through this work by Enable. So much more needs to be done, uh, much more needs to be done in areas for which this parliament uh, has responsibility. To this day, GPs and health professionals remain unable to effectively support women due to a lack of training and awareness. Uh, women with disabilities uh, are not incorporated into the reproductive uh, narrative or in policies. And I think as Annie Wells and Alison Johnson highlighted, there's still no workplace policy surrounding uh, the menopause. All of this can leave women feeling alone, or as the minister has said, uh, reminded us at the start of the debate, feeling invisible. Uh, we're still not doing enough to tackle menopausal stigma, and it's about time that changed. This is a shared endeavour. We all have an interest in seeing that situation improve, even if the stakes for some of us uh, are higher than they are for others. For now, however, I'd like to thank and congratulate the Minister once again for enabling Parliament to debate this important issue this afternoon, to give it the visibility that it needs and deserves. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Open debate. Uh, Rona Mackay to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm really pleased to be speaking in this debate and I'm delighted to hear that it's the first ever debate in this chamber on the menopause and in a UK Parliament and I'd like to congratulate, congratulate the Minister too for bringing it forward. Presiding Officer, for long as, as long as I can remember, the menopause has always been viewed as a bit of a joke. There are mugs, napkins, aprons, car stickers, you name it, all emblazoned with so-called hilarious slogans about, quotes the change. So we've heard the uh, statistics from the STUC Women's Committee and I think they're worth repeating that 63% of women said the menopause had been treated as a joke at work and 32% said it had been treated negatively in the workplace. That's simply unacceptable. It's certainly not a joke if you're one of the many women, more than half, who said they'd experienced negative and distressing symptoms. Let's be clear, the menopause isn't an illness. It's a natural part of ageing for more than half the entire population but it can be debilitating and affect women's everyday lives, as we know. And the Scottish Government want there to be a greater understanding in, the so in society of the symptoms that can cause misery for many women. That's why we need to talk about it, to raise awareness and end the taboo. Presiding officer, there are increasing numbers of older women in the workplace, just ask the WASPY women, and many more will experience the menopause while still at work. Some will sail through it, others will not. We know that stigma is worse for women in a male-dominated workplace and 99% of those surveyed didn't know whether there was a policy within the, work, uh, the workplace. Presiding officer, this is 2019. Managers and employers must be grown up enough to support women and to let them know what's available to them. The Scottish Government want to set a positive example in this area and is currently reviewing its workplace guidance, as we've heard from, from the Minister. Because the menopause is just one of the barriers women can face in the workplace because of gender and age. And I hesitate to use an old cliche, but I will. If men experienced the menopause, I doubt we'd even be having this debate. But presiding officer, taboo sub subjects appear to be a common factor when it comes to debating women's health issues. Menstruation, and this is period positive week, by the way, endometriosis, thyroid conditions, IVF treatment, and, and much more are often swept under the carpet eh, when it comes to talking about them and being open about them in the workplace. 
But we are making some headway. Uh, the Scottish Government is currently working with women's organisations and trade unions to get a, a clearer picture of the issues faced by women going through the menopause to identify other areas of action which may be taken. And uh, the Minister outlined what they are, and they seem very positive indeed. Targeted training, awareness raising, and working with employers to provide menopause related advice are finally beginning to happen. The world's first menopause cafe, as we've heard, was held in Perth in June after the excellent TV documentary presented by Kirsty Wark, which was, I think, probably the first time that this um, subject has been aired on a prime TV slot. And after an, an inspiring debate, a resolution was passed at the SNP conference in April for employers to give menopause training. However, I do think in taking up Alison Johnson's point that more research needs to be done into to treatment types um, aside from, from HRT. Um, I think uh, it is fantastic for some women, but obviously it does have some side effects for some, and we must continue to research other, um, other remedies. So, presiding officer, it's no longer acceptable for women to attend the doctors with a range of debilitating symptoms to be told it's just your age. And it's not acceptable for employers to jeopardise a woman's career by showing a lack of understanding or respect about this perfectly natural progress. And for those employers who aren't responsible enough to do this, ultimately the joke's on them and they'll be left behind as society moves on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Maurice Corey, to be followed by Julian Martin. Mr Corey, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is indeed a privilege today to speak in this debate this afternoon. And my wife is delighted that I am as well. Gosh, having to bear children and then later in life subjected to the menopausal symptoms, women do have to cope with a lot. And I salute their courage enormously and very much indeed uh, to you all here today. The now, the menopause has been a transition in life that has often been easily dismissed. It's been labelled as an unimportant or an uncomfortable topic of conversation, particularly when involving us men. But in my um, humble role as the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association's male champion for women in Scotland, although I recognise that no women here needs me to speak on their behalf, I am keen <laughs> to dispel any stigma or barrier that women uh, can face. In the workplace especially, the taboo of menopause certainly exists, and this taboo has caused a lack of understanding and sometimes even a general feeling of embarrassment. And the underlying thinking is that this is solely a women's issue and not the concern of anyone else. This simply should not be the case. And I fully understand this, slightly contrary to what Ren Mackay just said about us men, particularly in supporting my wife during some difficult times when I was overseas with my job some 2,500 miles away in the Balkans. And I had to fly home on some occasions to support her and my four children <clears throat> as a result of that. The menopause can, for some, feel like a stage of life unrecognized and easily dismissed. And indeed, as the Faculty of Occupational Medicine highlighted, the menopause is a hidden health concern. We can forget that it is a natural health condition, just as deserving of clear, practical guidance and support as any other. It is important to note the menopausal symptoms are different from each woman and can vary depending on where they live, be it in Scotland or indeed in the Commonwealth. These different factors can affect the severity of their symptoms. With this in mind, raising awareness needs to be attuned to the spectrum of experience these women have. There is zero benefit in fueling the taboo of menopause, especially as part of the problem, of course, can be plain ignorance. It is encouraging, therefore, to see more readily available advice and guidance. And indeed, only through more open communication about its symptoms can we better understand how women can feel and support they, the support they need. This is especially the case if they are in a workplace environment. It is alarming to note that a quarter of women over 50 have considered reducing their work hours due to the menopausal symptoms. And without this support, the danger is that more women might feel they cannot continue to work. And one of the most important areas where awareness can start is with the employers. Employers are the key to destigmatizing the menopause, especially if they implement a workplace menopause policy. And indeed, the 2018 report of the STUC's Women's Committee on this very topic showed that of those who took part in the survey, most said they either did not have or did not know if their employers had this policy in place. And I'm sure we all agree that this would be a much-needed policy to have in place with all employers. Stemming from this, employers need to encourage training on, the, on how best to deal with the menopause in a workplace culture. And this practical training 
and the practical training for colleagues is the key to proper education on women's experiences. And through this, we can fo foster understanding, awareness of the practical steps that we can take to help each other. And further options such as flexible working and small adjustments to the working day are almost most definitely worth exploring. For example, the UK government through the Women's Business Council has implemented an employer toolkit which suggests physical adaption options to the working environment designed to encourage work flexible working and I hope employers can be equipped and encouraged to do this, their part in this way. All of these efforts strive to raise awareness and start the conversation and indeed I welcome the number of campaigns that we have seen to date and which just do this. For example, the BBC's daily work up to wake up to the menopause week this month was an eye-opener, also particularly in the workplace. And further, world, the World uh, Menopause Day is marked every October, raising awareness of the health issues connected with the condition. Campaigns such as this are all about opening up the conversation, about encouraging active communication on how women can feel well supported and better understood. And this is how we can destigmatize the menopause. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope for an open and supportive dialogue about the menopause. This is how we truly validate the condition and ensure that women are supported, especially in their work place in this country and throughout the Commonwealth and efforts to raise awareness have certainly helped to break this taboo but it will take a real and practical change in the working environment with commitment from everyone to truly address this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much Mr Corey and I call Julie Martin who will be followed by Elaine Smith. Ms Martin. Thank you President Officer. There are a raft of subjects that are firmly in a box marked things your granny says you should keep to yourself. Periods are in there, and as of late, down to campaigners and period poverty and tampon tax, of which I count myself one, the taboo around talking openly about menstruation has been eroded. And the menopause is in that box too. And with all due respect to our grannies, not talking about the symptoms of menopause is doing us no favours. Because menopause, as everyone has said, is a natural part of life. And women in the workplace have been coping silently forever. Now, if we've been managing life whilst keeping our symptoms hidden, we can manage it even better if those around us understand them and give us an extra bit of support when we need it. And I don't want this to turn into a debate that gives people more reasons not to employ older women, because we do cope, but we cope in secret. And there's limited information about the menopause and its impact on women in the workplace, yet by law, all workplaces should have an effective gender-sensitive gender policy in place. That's entirely consistent with the provisions in the Health and Safety at Work Act, the Workplace Regulations, the Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations, and the Public, uh, public Sector Equality Duty as part of the Equality Act. But I wonder how many perimenopausal women, if they just went into the, speak to their boss and ask them what their policy is on the menopause, would get any kind of an answer. And I kind of feel for the boss that's been asked as well, because would they even know that they had one? Right now, those of us who are perimenopausal, I am one, Emma, Emma Harper has made me a fan out of the business bulletin, um, we, we, might, we might have extra, extremely heavy periods that, don't come, that come with no warning and can't be dealt with very easily. Um, we might have those debilitating, severe hot sweats. They don't just happen at night. I might have to leave a room suddenly to deal with either of those things. I might not be able to sleep. And a flexible working pattern might help me get through a period of insomnia. And all of those things don't mean that I can't do a good job. They just mean that I can have to do it a wee bit differently from time to time. And it doesn't, isn't a consistent thing as well. It goes in peaks and troughs. But I'm lucky. I'm the boss. I'm the boss in my constituency office. I can work around that. What if I was working at a till in Tesco? You know, what if, what if I was working a shift? What if I was you know, managing a, a petrol station or something like that? So a lot of people have mentioned the survey, uh, the STU, uh, STUC Women's Committee, and I won't, I won't rehash that, but if, if a third of, of female employers feel that menopause was treated negatively, or they heard it been talked about as a joke, they're less likely to even bring it up at work because um, they don't want to be ridiculed. But I was very pleased to discover last year in October that the SNP-run South Lanarkshire Council uh, was the first to grasp the nettle and the uh, first local authority in Scotland to introduce a menopause policy to help support its female workforce. Uh, workforce. And, and it's already been mentioned, the deputy provost there, Colette Stevenson, she said it's an important issue for an organisation of any size to recognise. Um, the support. And our council colleague, uh, Councillor Katie Loudon, along with our, our, our minister, um, Claire Hawkey, brought forward a motion in line with that at the SNP party conference, and it's now our party policy. 
So I'll be writing to Aberdeenshire Council to ask what, if any, policy they have in place. And I know that some of my councillor colleagues have already directly raised the issue. But what could a policy look like? Well, it could consider the specific needs of menopausal women and ensure that the workplace environment will not make their symptoms worse. Paid time off for treatments such as hormone replacement therapy or CBT, but flexible working patterns as well make, making reasonable adjustments to, to workplaces like flexibility in, in breaks, remote working and flexible start times. And it strikes me that smokers probably have more flexibility than anyone to go and take breaks whenever they want than women suffering from the menopause. And also introducing a culture, a respectful culture where menopause is talked about respectfully between colleagues. Um, whatever we get out of this debate, it's welcome that we opened up that box and we're talking about it. But I just want to say one other thing, just about clinical uh, interventions. I'd also like to go into a doctor's surgery and be offered advice that isn't just, we'll put you on HRT. There are lots of coping me mechanisms out there, and I'd like our medical professionals to look outside the clinical interventions and help us out in that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Elaine Smith, who will be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. I wasn't actually sure whether I wanted to take part in this historic debate today, as I've already spoken honestly about my thyroid problems in the Chamber, so discussing yet another personal health and wellbeing issue I thought might be challenging. And, of course, there are connections with thyroid and menopause, which I'll come back to if I have time. President Officer, it was refreshing to see women on BBC Breakfast, as others have mentioned, talking about the menopause along with their families, who are obviously also affected. And there were some innovative ideas for helping symptoms. But much as I like swimming, I'm not sure I fancy swimming in freezing cold water, as mentioned earlier by Annie Wells. However, if it helps, then I would say that you should go for it. There have also been uh, wider media discussions and political discussions which have helped encourage a new culture of talking openly about the menopause. And of course, ending the stigma of the menopause should not be necessary. Why should a natural physical process affecting half the population have a stigma attached to it at all? But sadly, it does. And so clearly we need more discussion, information and understanding so that the menopause is everybody's issue and not just the women going through it. I took some soundings about the debate and what people might think in the workplace and some of the comments that I got included my colleagues always sleeping in and coming in late, she's tired, she's grumpy, moaning about aches and pains, too hot, too cold, suffering from anxiety and very emotional. I suppose anyone working or living with a woman going through the menopause would recognise some or all of these symptoms. But instead of those kind of comments, it would be better if people recognise that their colleague or their manager is going through the menopause and then they might better understand what she has to deal with whilst also working. And it might result in more support, more empathy and adjusted workplace conditions. For example, cool water being available, flexi hours, relaxation of a uniform policy if there is one and provision of fans. It doesn't help, um, obviously, that women are having to work until they are much older, whether they like it or not. And for women in poverty, there's little hope of uh, early retirement. And instead, they could be doing two and more zero hours part-time jobs, trying to make ends meet. I think this kind of debate um, will help to raise awareness. And obviously, it's the first of its kind. Congratulations to the Minister for that. But we also need action for workplace assistance, and we need better medical help and advice. I mentioned thyroid, uh, sorry, and I ought to have said that the, the workplace assistance is, of course, something being pushed for by the STUC. I mentioned um, thyroid problems earlier. I want to briefly touch on how the menopause can be even more difficult for thyroid sufferers who, as we know, are mainly women. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the intervention to the minister, women are often not being tested for thyroid disorder later in life because of the symptoms being similar to the menopause. However, thyroid problems can increase the risk of complications associated with the menopause. For instance, during the menopause, women are more likely to develop osteoporosis, a condition, as we know, where bone density is reduced. And similarly, the risk of cardiovascular disease increases, and thyroid conditions also increase the risk and can interact, resulting in complications. I think that if women on uh, thyroid medication are then prescribed HRT or choose to take it. They need to be monitored closely and I would say preferably by an endocrinologist. Overall, thyroid disorder is an area of medicine that needs much more research, including its impact during the menopause. Presiding officer, when I was the deputy presiding officer and chairing a session, I kept a fan under 
that desk. But I only used it when the camera was on, clearly on another member. I would sneak it out, I would use it, and then I would hide it again. But really, I should have felt more empowered to use that fan when I needed to, to do my job more comfortably. Recently, I went out with my husband Van to a local bar. I was only in the door when I suffered a terrible hot flush. And without asking or saying a word, Karen, one of the staff, handed me a fan. That kind of sisterly understanding and help is extremely welcome. Overall, and in conclusion, we need flexible working solutions. We need more support and practical help, specialist women's clinics, specialist nurses, or at least more time with the GP. What we don't need are misogynistic jokes, a lack of understanding, and predominantly male doctors telling us it's just their age, so get on with it. Mandy Rhodes at the conference said, some subjects wait for a whole generation to catch up. The menopause has now found its time. This is Generation M. Let's get behind it and embrace this particular change. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by uh, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Just a, a quick word to uh, Monica Lennon. Uh, I've sat round the boardroom table at the Bank of England on a number of occasions. I, of course, left banking after 30 years to come into politics to improve my reputation. Um, and just a little thing that uh, Elaine Smith has just illustrated, perhaps, about the advice that we all sometimes receive about things. Um, the last thing that you wish to do if you have a hot flush or you're sweating or your temperature's rise is to take a cold drink. And the reason for that is a cold drink will actually boost your system and turn the temperature up. Because when the cold drink hits your stomach, it's very close to blood vessels and your temperature rises. That's why in the Middle East people eat chai, drink chai banana, which is warm tea. Because putting something warm in your stomach lowers your temperature and reduces the flush. Medical advice often doesn't cover these very, very simple things. But of course, the whole issue of the menopause is not simply a medical issue. It's not just a physical issue. It's a social uh, and employment issue. And of course, it's not just an issue for women, but it's also an issue uh, for us men. I'm glad that uh, I think four of us are going to speak in this debate uh, today. And it's an issue for us, uh, perhaps, simply because we are there to provide support for those close to us who are affected by this issue. But we also may find ourselves employed by women or employing women who are affected uh, by this. We will also meet casually and formally uh, women who are affected by it. I may say uh, Elaine Smith very effectively concealed the use of the fan in previous uh, session, and I congratulate her on it, uh, but she deserves every support for that. And we will meet uh, pre-menopausal or perimenopausal uh, women who are worried about how I really don't have time, do forgive me, uh, how we men may react to the menopausal symptoms. So I think we men have a duty uh, to be part of an environment in which women feel comfortable uh, about uh, the menopause because it's something that will happen to all our female friends, relatives, and, and people we meet. And it's part of men learning to deal with their hormone issues which largely take us to have more aggressive responses to circumstances that we find uncomfortable about. And we have to learn uh, to be much more supportive in our relationships with people we love and people we meet and people we just bump into. Uh, placing neither the male nor the female in a superior or inferior position uh, to one or the other, but simply to recognize that there are differences that arise uh, from gender. It's uh, interesting that uh, Professor Mary Minkin of Yale Medical School has done some research on the effects of this and found that Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian women are most likely to report that going through the menopause is better than they expected. But she found that women in the US, the UK, and Canada say their experience is worse than expected. Now that tells us that this is not simply a physical and hormonal change, but it's also something about the information that people have and how society reacts to people. 
We've heard uh, some references to diet, exercise, and attitudes to getting older. Well, I'd like people to like older people a bit better, being the only septuagenarian speaking uh, this afternoon. In Japan, the older revered, but here we're more likely uh, to be uh, pitied. Uh, Presiding officer, just in conclusion, um, we've talked a little bit about uh, employment. And the DWP actually are reporting that the highest increases in recent times in employment are in the 60, 64 and 55 to 59 age group. Uh, that's what in gender uh, has, uh, has, has told us. So, presiding officer, I very much welcome this debate and the opportunity to participate in it. I hope I leave the debate a little better informed and a little better prepared to deal with the effect in men and women of the menopause. I'm tempted to say thank you, Dr. Stevenson, for your uh, medical advice. Uh, I called Joan McAlpine to be followed by Alison Harris. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to speak in this debate today, and I'd like to congratulate the Minister on the energy she personally has put into banishing the stigma of the menopause. And getting this topic to the Chamber for the first time ever is a significant achievement. But the fact that we haven't debated it before speaks volumes about where Parliament has placed female priorities in the past. I also want to praise the STUC Women's Committee and the Scottish Women's Convention who have done so much invaluable work in this area, as we've heard, and also to highlight some best practice. NHS Dumfries and Galloway has provided specialist menopause clinics and a helpline for over 20 years and regularly provides information services to public and staff. And this week, in the wonderful new DGRI hospital, uh, we saw an edition of BBC Breakfast focused on the menopause as part of its Wake Up to the Menopause Week and shows Jane McCubbin interviewed clinicians including gynaecologist, osteoporosis specialists and GPs in the region about their excellent work. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank them for all they do and hope that others around Scotland will emulate them in the future. Now, in researching this speech, I was quite surprised to discover that human female menopause is almost unique. Apparently, the only other comparable mammal species where females live well beyond the childbearing years is killer whales. Make of that what you will. I would, I would venture to suppose it's because older women are as fierce, as impressive and beautiful and determined as any pod of orcas. A number of female academics have researched the, the purpose of the human female menopause and observed that mo the most successful societies depend on the contribution made by older women. There's even a term for it in anthropology and it's called the grandmother hypothesis. In pre-industrial societies, the presence of a grandmother vastly improves child mortality, for example. But anthropologists have also noted that the benefits of having lots of healthy older women go beyond childcare and family responsibilities. They often do large amounts of the work, the physical work, social organisation, community cohesion, and uh, they, they were observed to be the linchpins of many successful traditional societies. But of course, that observation can equally be made about our own complex modern societies. The opening of the conference on menopause earlier this year, the chair of the Scottish Women's Convention, Agnes Tolmey, had this to say, these women are carers, they are workers, they are the very backbone of our communities and our society. And she's absolutely correct in that assertion, which of course means that ensuring menopausal women are healthy is not just essential for the well-being of those individual women themselves, which is of course extremely important, but it's important for society as a whole. But as we've heard, society as a whole often still doesn't get it. And that's illustrated by the findings from that survey from the STUC Women's Committee, which found that one in three women said menopause was treated negatively in the workplace, while almost two in three found it was treated as a joke. And Agnes Tolmey said in the same speech, the stigma attached to menopause illustrates much of the wider inequalities women experience in a variety of areas. And she's absolutely correct in that. The wider discrimination against women is on the basis of their biology. Younger women can experience discrimination because of their ability or their perceived ability to get pregnant. And they certainly face discrimination as a result of motherhood. And now we understand that that discrimination persists into middle age and old age because of the menopause. Second wave feminist writing in the 1960s and to the 1980s had an analysis 
of, of that patriarchal society based on this understanding of biology, which found that women suffered that collective discrimination as a sex class. We've made considerable process since then, progress since then, um, but women still suffer significant discrimination, especially poorer women and disabled women, whether it's through period poverty or, or low pay because of motherhood. And I therefore welcome the Minister's own comments when she addressed the Scottish Women's Convention earlier this year, when she pointed out that the Equality Act 2010 protects women against workplace discrimination on the basis of sex and age. And we should use that legal framework more effectively to tackle the discrimination that they face as a result of menopause. Uh, I agree with that and I would suggest that fulfilling the public sector equality duty uh, is very important for all organisations and it's particularly important that they gather information as they're legally obliged to do uh, on the protected characteristic of sex. It's, it's, uh, it's increasingly the case that many organisations through poor training are confusing sex with gender or even gender identity. But menopausal women suffer discrimination because of their biological sex and it's vital that we recognise and record that. I'd like to end on a positive note by returning to the earlier point that menopause can be a positive thing. It frees women from the fear of unwanted pregnancy and the inconvenience uh, around menstruation, often pain. Germaine Greer said it could be viewed, uh, viewed as a liberation because the pressure put on younger women to look beautiful, to be attractive to men, uh, is itself a type of prison and menopause is opening the door of that prison and finding a, a new stage in life. As I said, postmenopausal women are the linchpins of our community. My personal experience of that was having uh, two older women help me bring up my children while they had careers themselves and were carers uh, for other disabled relatives too. Uh, menopausal women are extraordinary, they're not a problem, they're an asset and I'm glad that we've had this debate today where we can celebrate them. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say to members, I've been, I've been light touch uh, on timings because we did have some time in hand but uh, two minutes over is maybe just a little bit too light touch. Uh, I call Alison Harris to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Alison, please. I I'm sorry, Ms Harris, please. All right. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to speak in today's debate, the first here in the Scottish Parliament, following the success of the debate on World Menopause Day in the House of Commons back in October last year. The menopause can affect adult women of almost all ages, although the average age in the UK is 51. And can I thank other MSPs who have listed the many symptoms already today. My first experience of the menopause was from seeing my mum. I think she had it really quite tough and I know it went on for years. She was always renowned for having a fan in every handbag. Now here I am. I've reached that age and I must confess I too carry a fan in every handbag for those moments. And I'm quite happy to lend it out should anyone need it. And at night, I now feel like I'm constantly doing the hokey-cokey in my bed, my legs in, out, in, out, all the night. I try and deal with these things with a bit of humour because I find it helps me personally. I don't know if any others here have seen the, the, well, the musical, Menopause the Musical. I have, and it was actually very funny. Not because the menopause is a joke, because it isn't. I was laughing more in empathy than anything else. I actually recognised myself on that stage. But the show did a really good job of normalising a taboo subject. And when I say taboo, I mean in public or workplaces. It's easier when I speak to my girlfriends about it because it's what we're all experiencing. However, it's quite a different story when you're in a business meeting or on a train or the bus during rush hour. When you suddenly feel one of those moments coming on, it can make you feel quite anxious and fill you with absolute dread. And I know it's not just me. An ITV Tonight survey in 2016 found that a quarter of women had considered leaving their jobs because of the effects of the menopause. Fortunately, I've come to terms with dealing with it in a working environment. I now just come right out and openly say, I'm having a hot flush. But I know that not every woman feels like that and where they work. You know, they work in places where they just can't say that. A survey for BBC's Radio 4 Women's Hour last January revealed that 70% of respondents did not tell their bosses that they were experiencing these symptoms. And that is, a, that is a huge number of women. We need to make workplaces more understanding of the menopause. 
because it really is just a fact of life, part of being a woman. The same as when you're younger and you hit puberty and your periods begin. I'm a firm believer that these facts of life shouldn't get in the way of your own life or career. We have to think about what we can do to help women navigate through these stages of life in the easiest possible way. From developing workplace measures that reduce the anxiety around talking about the menopause, to educating children and young people so the topic becomes normalised in the future. Raising awareness is one of the best ways to do this. And I'd like to join others in thanking Rachel Weiss and her work in establishing menopause cafes throughout the UK, which have allowed women to speak with others going through the exact same experience as them. And to build on this, there is more we can do to reduce the stigma around the menopause. I know this because fantastic strides have been made in the last decade towards reducing other stigmas. Mental health has gone from something we didn't talk about to a national focus. Tackling stigmas head on and normalising them is a proven way of making things better. On the menopause, perhaps we can begin to set those wheels in motion here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I call full to McGregor. Mr McGregor is the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McGregor, please. Uh, thank you, President Nossam. I'd also like to uh, thank and pay tribute to the Minister for, for bringing uh, this important subject forward. And I think that it is fair to say that we can be proud for debating this for the first time in the chamber and I certainly agree with the motion uh, that for too long menopause has been a subject that, um, that it's just treated uh, as a joke and, and, and something uh, that is a bit taboo. And before speaking in this debate, President Officer, I, I was actually a bit worried uh, about standing up here and speaking, not because I don't think that we should be talking about it, but as a man, as a male, what, what do I know about this subject? But the conversations actually that I've had over the last day or so in preparation of speaking today have revealed to me that I'm probably exactly the person that should be standing up here speaking and to my male colleagues uh, as well who done so because I've actually learned quite a lot and how important it is that we normalise uh, this subject, the subject of menopause. And the way that we're making perhaps strides in, in mental health and um, we're hopefully getting to a place where people are feeling more able to speak about it in their, um, in their workplace and in other scenarios, we should be moving on a similar road with menopause. And every woman should have access to information, education, advice and emotional support to empower them to take control of their health and well-being during this normal phase of life. And too many women have been told that it's just a natural phase and they'll just have to get on with it. And we've heard other, others speak about that really powerfully today. However, as we've also heard, the symptoms can vary widely and, it, and in many cases little advice or support is given and there's still much fear and confusion around the subject of hormone replacement therapy amongst both doctors and women with 67 percent of women recently surveyed as we've already heard said there was a general lack of support or advice for those going through the menopause and who wouldn't be worried about hormone replacement therapy um, and, and the possible consequences even even the words themselves uh, you know you know, can, can cause dread. So, but as Rona Mackay said, what if this was commonplace for men? And I know there is uh, men, I know it's a minority that, that perhaps need androgen replacement therapy, but uh, it's not anywhere near the same scale. But what if it was more commonplace for men? I think we would be talking about this very freely and there would be supports already in place. And it would be a different, different subject altogether. And, and we know as well that what presents yet another challenge in the Health survey published in October 2014, 70% of female workers said they felt unsupported. One in five felt their symptoms were affecting their work and one in 10 had considered quitting. Nine out of 10 women said they were unable to talk to a manager or colleague. 18% they needed to take time off. One in 50 was in long-term sick leave, but few disclosed the real reason for their absence. And I just find those statistics shocking. I hear that, that um, as has been mentioned uh, by Gillian Martin and by the Minister, the good progress being made in my neighbouring South Lanarkshire Council, and I'm pleased that two of our S SNP councillors in North Lanarkshire Councillors Anderson and Fotheringham lodged a motion which was passed in October 2019 that ensured that North Lanarkshire Council are committed to further planned work to ensure that a policy should be introduced to positively, positively impact on the female workforce, with the council providing appropriate support to women who are experiencing symptoms of the menopause. However, since October last year, when this passed, there has been no progress on the creation of a policy by the North Lanarkshire Council 
officials, none. Backed up just today by an email to Councillor Carragher, who spoke to the Council and who, who confirmed that no work had been done on developing a policy. And she said, I was told it was, I, it was felt doing so would complicate matters, as the Council already has mechanisms in place to better assist, but it was accepted that better knowledge of these mechanisms was required. What makes this worse, President officer, is that 79% of North Lancashire Council's workforce are female. To have not even bothered to work in a policy that will affect over three quarters of your workforce at some point is just simply unacceptable. Now, I do understand that there are um, policies in place such as special leave, flexible working hours, uh, on a short-term basis, stuff like that, but, but to not act in a policy that neighbouring South Lancashire have done is disconcerting and bad practice. If I've got time, President officer. No, nope, apologies, Elaine, thanks. Um, I, I can see that I'm actually well over time, and, and when I, as I said, when I first um, decided to speak in the debate, I didn't, I didn't think I'd been in that position, but um, I, it's, it's been a, a very much learning curve for me, President officer, and I think that every woman and man deserves to understand this phase of life, because for too many individuals and relationships suffer because of a lack of understanding of menopause, and I'm happy to leave it at that, President officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I move to closing speeches, I'm asking myself where for art now, Mr. Corey. No doubt he will be giving me a little note, uh, presiding officer, a little note. Mr. Bowman, you're going to make sure it happens. Uh, I now call Polly McNeill to close for Labour, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you, presiding officer. It is time to end the stigma of the menopause, and I believe you're helping to do this by debating it today, thanks to Christina McKelvey for bringing the first ever debate uh, to the Scottish Parliament. In fact, I thought 20 years ago it would be inconceivable, actually, that people would be prepared to come and take part in the debate, never mind a government minister uh, bring it forward. But I think it does show how far that we have come, that we are prepared to talk publicly about an intimate health and welfare issue that hopefully women who read this debate and see this debate will give them some encouragement to talk about it themselves. I think it's a liberation that we can talk about the menopause and not the change. I think it was Alison uh, Johnson that said that. Uh, and then we've heard um, from Elaine Smith and Alison Harris, uh, perhaps we should actually have some Scottish Parliament edition fans. Uh, I think it would certainly be well used, that's for sure. Breaking the silence on the menopause, uh, when Kirsty Walk spoke out about it, she talked about her experience brought on by a hysterectomy, as many women have to do early in their life. And that brings on the menopause because you're not producing estrogen anymore. And that has obvious consequences for your health. Uh, Sharon Edwards from the SDUC Women's uh, Committee has been mentioned many times. Uh, it's worth repeating that for far too long the menopause, she says, has been an issue shrouded in secrecy, resigned to whisper in conversations uh, between men or between women and many jokes um, about hot flushes. Um, so Annie Wells she talked about um, that women who no longer felt that they were good company, I mean, it is a sad reflection. And as Monica Lennon says, I mean, there's up to 34 symptoms uh, and that you can possibly um, have. It, it struck me that if a woman herself doesn't know what she's about to face, then how does she know what she needs from her partner? And I think that's what that needs to be done. Women, uh, if, you know what the, if you know what the battle ahead is, most women will be able to take that battle on. And I think that's why the services need to wrap around that principle. Uh, I think it was Morris Golden that said, I mean, in, in fact, what he's summarising is the pain of womanhood, uh, puberty, periods, childbirth, smear tests, mammograms, premenopause, menopause. Um, we should be shaping our services accordingly. It's meant to be a natural process, but there's a hell of a lot of pain attached to some of that. But despite all this, we know the women who've uh, come through it and they still remain brilliant and hardworking. Lee MacArthur, I think, rightly described it as a health inequality that we have to put right. But as others have talked about, that means that there has to be changes in the workforce because the demographics um, have also changed in employment in the workforce. We have more older uh, women. Uh, many women are reluctant to share their experiences of their symptoms with their employers, naturally, GPs, friends or families, because of a lack of understanding in society. It's clear that we believe this must change. The SUC Women's Committee survey last year uh, had a 3,500 
uh, people, uh, women responded to that. 63% said that the menopause had been treated as a joke at work. Uh, the largest increase in employment rates during the last 30 years are older women. Uh, women aged 55 to 59 has increased about 20%. The symptoms of the menopause can have negative impacts on women's economic participation. The workplace environment can significantly affect a woman's ability to manage their symptoms at work. For example, inadequate ventilation, which has been talked about, the lack of appropriate toilet facilities, crowded workspaces, inflexible working arrangements. These are the issues that should be at the top of employers' agendas and trade union agendas when they are negotiating better policies in the workplace. Doctors too need better support. Uh, nearly two thirds of GPs in the UK do not feel confident treating the menopause. This has to change because if GPs don't feel confident, then how can the women themselves only half receive training or managing the menopause? And that is particularly concerning for us. Almost two thirds of women responding to the Scottish Women's Convention Service felt that there was not enough information available to them when first identifying the symptoms relating to the menopause and how to manage it. Uh, of the 3,500 women who responded to the STC Women's Committee survey, over half of the participants who took part in that were already going through the menopause. The presiding officer, in closing, I hope that this is a subject which, which we return, and I think the job of politicians here in this parliament is to work together and not only to identify, to remove the stigma and the taboo of talking about the menopause, but to shape the services accordingly, the kind of services that women need, and to talk to the people who need to change their attitude. Uh, and that's primarily a lot to do with the workplace. And I think the world will be a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Colin Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, presiding officer. May I say you've missed a great debate today. And in closing, for the Scottish Conservatives, I would like to thank everyone, including uh, the Minister, for bringing this to the Chamber. And finally, we are starting, I feel, to see society move in the right direction when it comes to the menopause, but there is still a long way to go. And let's be clear, menopause, as many have pointed out, is completely normal, as normal as pregnancy or periods. Um, however, my mother and my grandmother never talked about their experience of menopause, and I really believed that it was quite normal uh, to walk around wearing a cotton sundress in the winter. And it is an unavoidable fact that most women do go through the menopause. And we've heard today it affects women in many different ways. Despite this, there does remain a certain stubborn stigma about it. And Maurice Corrie highlighted sharing experiences and indeed how the first steps towards destigmatizing menopause is to talk about it in a way that normalizes it. It's completely normal, as many have said today, and this shouldn't be a taboo subject. I want to thank my Conservative colleagues, Annie Wells and Alison Harris, for speaking about their own experiences, and indeed Rachel uh, McLean MP, who led a, a menopause awareness campaign. She believes that too many women are not getting the treatment they deserve. And during a speech in the House of Commons on World Menopause Day uh, 2018, she highlighted the need for better education. She said, that menopause, and I quote, needs to come into the school curriculum and be part of what schools are talking about. Let us look at how we can do that, because surely it is not that hard. I couldn't agree more with that statement, as it's extremely important that we teach not only young women and girls about it, but also young men and boys too. And it was so refreshing um, that uh, three men, I think today, uh, four, four, sorry, four men spoke today in this debate. Um, so but by providing factual education, whether it's through NHS or through schools, about the symptoms, women can prepare for what is to come, what to expect, and in turn increase the ability for their own families and friends and work colleagues to actually be aware of, of what is happening. And certainly this is something I would ask the Scottish Government to do, particularly when it comes to young persons' personal and social education lessons. And what about the workplace? Many have talked about the workplace uh, here today. Employers do have an important role to play and should be encouraged to introduce support pol policies into the workplace, which is what um, Alison Johnson spoke about, a, a workplace menopause policy. And Maurice Corey also talked about the Women's Business Council who have developed a toolkit for employers, um, which enables employers to make adaptations and the right workplace environment and, and support flexible working hours and raise awareness indeed of menopause. 
many people in the chamber spoke about the workplace. And again, Alison Johnson reminded us that half of the workplace is female. And that Gillian Martin also said it is right that the menopause is not a reason to not employ older women, which was also um, highlighted by Joan McAlpine, who spoke about the benefit of um, older women in society and in the workplace. And, in, and Stuart Stevenson spoke about that too. Um, it is really worrying that one in four women over 50 consider cutting their hours uh, due to menopausal symptoms. And it's not just something that we should uh, load onto uh, employers here. We should also do what Liam MacArthur talked about, which is to deal with the health inequalities, how important that is, that menopausal symptoms are correctly identified and managed by GPs. Again, something that Elaine Smith is a fantastic advocate about and talks about the symptoms and the similarities of underactive thyroid um, compared to uh, menopause. And it's so important that that we use research um, to the advancement of, of treatment and getting the symptoms right and then working alongside employ employers is perhaps something that um, actually will bring it to the fore, will destigmatize it and uh, will actually allow women to stay in the workplace for longer. The BBC today has unusually received uh, compliments um, and lots of, of members have talked about the uh, welcome BBC Breakfast Launch, uh, Wake Up to the Menopause campaign. And they ran a, a week of menopause clips looking at everything from symptoms to workplace issues, educating the public on how women may feel and what help people can offer. And it followed the Menopause and Me, a documentary by Kirsty Walk. And she has been absolutely fantastic in breaking down the stigma. The documentary goes some way in tackling the negative perceptions women face um, because of menopausal effects and her involvement in the programme came because of her own sudden and unexpected experience. She had a medical menopause at the age of 47 after hysterectomy and coming off uh, hormone replacement therapy because of fears over its link to breast cancer. She felt that because the menopause was never spoken about she was isolated and felt unable to talk about her experiences. So perhaps this debate today um, will allow other women to feel comfortable or more comfortable about speaking about their own experiences with other women and indeed men and perhaps their, their children and their workplace. The isolation aspect was recently highlight, highlighted by the British Menopause so Society survey which found that 23% of women feel isolated as a result of menopausal effects and we need to see greater societal change in order to help women feel comfortable about speaking more openly um, about their experiences, not for others to be critical or judgmental or prejudiced against women experiencing the menopause. In conclusion, presiding officer, it's been really encouraging today to hear contributions from across the chamber. I'm actually really scared about going through the whole thing myself, mm -hmm. uh, listening to everybody's experiences, but actually, I don't think I've ever spoken about it in public, so it's actually amazing, and, and thank you. Um, I'm glad that there's a strong recognition from all parties that we must do more to tackle the stigma. And I commend the British Menopause Society for their work that they've done and the support that their volunteers offer right across the country. It's and the cafes that we've also heard about today. And it's people such as them that make a real difference to women's experience. So I hope going forward from this debate, we can see the Scottish Government set out their next steps in supporting Scottish women. Thank you. Thank you, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman, to wind up this afternoon's debate. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by uh, thanking all of the members who've contributed to this afternoon's debate. It is important that Parliament has come together to send an unambiguous message that we support and value women at all stages of our lives. And before I go any further, can I congratulate the Parliament itself, who I know will shortly launch its own policy on periods and the menopause. Uh, like uh, others, Alison Harris and others, uh, my first experience of the menopause uh, was my mum. And what I remember uh, was irritability, tiredness, tearfulness, but it was never explained and it was never spoken of. And what I remember as a young girl is being very anxious that something was wrong with my mum. And uh, being an imaginative young girl, uh, I think I had her dead and buried a couple of times, but it was never, ever spoken of. Um, 
before I turn to uh, what members uh, have said, uh, can I just in passing thank Pauline McNeill for recognising that women who have come through it are brilliant and hardworking. And that is a very personal thanks from me. Um, Annie Wells talked about the menopause as a natural part of ageing, and it is. The problem is that the experience of women in the workplace and elsewhere is that somehow what is happening is not natural. Uh, somehow it's our fault. We're being difficult and we're being troublesome. And for us as women, it can also be a hard thing to face up to. Because what it signals, whether we recognise it or not, is the end of our capacity to naturally conceive. And whether we rail against this or not, we have subsumed the notion that conception and the bearing of children is an essential part of our femininity. It is also a signal that our life and our lifespan is finite. And those things are hard to face up to. So yes, it's important to recognise physical symptoms and the postmenopausal impact on our physical health, but it is also very important to recognise the psychological effect on our mental health, not just of the symptoms, but sometimes of what it feels to us this means. Yes. Monica Lennon. I think we will all have read the very helpful briefing from in Jane's I hadn't been aware of this, but they point out that the mental health strategy makes no reference to menopause. And in fact, there's only four references to women. Two of those are in relation to perinatal mental health. Is that something that could be looked at for the, the next update to the, the strategy? I'll come to that in a minute, but I, I, I'm not sure that the mental health strategy should mention the menopause, but I think the delivery of our work on mental health and our work in primary care should absolutely recognise the impact on potential impact on women's mental health of the menopause. So I'm very happy to take on the spirit of that, uh, if not exactly uh, what is being asked for. In terms of health more widely, there is a real need. Uh, I think Alison Harris touched on it, but it occurred to me strongly through the debate uh, for wider education, uh, particularly in primary care, where some of the issues Elaine Smith raised on the assumptions that are made about uh, women about the, and some of the misdiagnosis and some of the failure to recognise the interrelationship between other conditions and the menopause and medication, where some of that can be found. Um, for the majority of women, of course, experiencing menopause, uh, sympt menopause symptoms, uh, appropriate management advice and treatment is would be available and should be available through primary care services. And where there are more complex issues, uh, for example, with other medical conditions, then medication referral is made to secondary care. People have touched on uh, what the health service does in terms of of the menopause. There are specific menopause clinics in NHS Dumfries and Galloway, Fife, Grampian, Lothian and Tayside. And in health boards, specialist gynaecology services are also available for women. In addition, there are a number of additional clinics recognised by the British Menopause Society in Glasgow, in uh, Clyde, in Highland, in South Lanarkshire, in Ayrshire and Arran and elsewhere. Uh, but what we do recognise is that there is a need for significant additional training, particularly in primary care, so that the uh, understanding uh, is there amongst the wider primary care workforce. And in some of the work that we are undertaking, I'm very happy uh, to commit to looking at that uh, again. Education, though, has to go further than uh, primary care or our medical workforce. workforce. Realistic medicine, so well advocated by our chief medical officer and her team, centres on meaningful conversations between people and healthcare professionals. To do that, to actually have that meaningful conversation as the person on the other side of the desk, from the GP or the advanced nurse practitioner or whoever it might be, we need as individuals to be both more confident and more knowledgeable. And so, while I'd want us to avoid over-medicalising what is a natural part of our life, I do think, and Alison, uh, uh, Alison did mention this, we need to start our work much earlier with young women and girls. We need to know that menstruation is normal, but be ready to recognise the symptoms, for example, as we've mentioned in other debates of endometriosis. And 
uh, not allow them to be confused with just a heavy period. We need to understand as women what is happening in our bodies and be uh, prepared to argue and confident in our knowledge to argue our case and present uh, what our needs in primary care and elsewhere. Knowledge is powerful and normalising all of this natural uh, bodily functions and changes to our bodies is entirely critical in this regard. As Leah MacArthur said, ending inequality at every level starts by talking, opening, talking openly and listening well. So I'm very happy to commit today in this debate to working across government with colleagues in education and elsewhere to increase information, starting in schools, absolutely where that needs to happen, uh, but all through our health service to improve the information, uh, increase what is available, improve understanding and support women in health related issues that we face. There is indeed more for us to do and I will continue uh, the discussions that have begun with the Chief Medical Officer and others about how much more we can do to raise awareness and strengthen menopause services in Scotland. Uh, finally, uh, much of the debate, Presiding Officer, has focused rightly on the workplace. NHS Scotland is our largest employer and uh, many of the issues raised and discussed here today that women will face in other workplaces will indeed be faced by women in health and social care. It is the case that NHS Scotland does not have a standardised policy on the menopause. I hope members will take my assurance that it will very soon. Uh, yes, of course. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. And on that point, um, obviously we've discussed the fact that many councils don't have policies either, but rather than simply criticise them for that, I wonder if the Minister would agree with me that we should take a cross-party approach to encouraging them to put policies in place. And can I encourage members to keep their conversations down? Cabinet Secretary. I, I absolutely agree with that. I'd be, I'd be pretty poorly placed, actually, to criticise uh, another uh, organisation for not having a workplace policy on this issue when our own health service right at this minute does not. So we will take, I will take that forward. Um, but I do think it is right that what we do collectively is encourage all employers, be they private or public sector, to take this issue seriously to develop those workplace policies and that we offer them support uh, where that is uh, helpful to them uh, in order to do that. Normalising all of this, this is part and parcel of your life as a woman. Normalising it, talking about it, asking for the support and the help that we need, be that from the health service, be it more widely from our employers, be it more widely from our uh, society or indeed intimately from our partners is something that we should uh, encouraged to happen. Uh, I think we were described as Generation M by uh, Mandy Rhodes. I don't want future generations to be Generation M. I want this generation of women to be the ones that normalise this, end the stigma, stigma, working with men and with others across our country so that young women coming through do not have to face some of the issues that women today have had to face in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And that concludes our debate on it's time to end the stigma of the menopause. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 17368 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a change to tomorrow's business. Uh, could I call on Graeme Day to move the motion? Presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak uh, against or for the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 17368 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now, there is one question at decision time today. The question is that motion 17347 in the name of Christina McKelvey on it's time to end the stigma of the menopause be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. So we'll now move to members' business in the name of Colin Beatty on International Museum Day. And we'll just take a few moments for members and uh, the minister to change seats. Sure.